is Real Kipper and Board on Sportsnet 590 The Fan. What a weekend. <laughs> As we continue our shows. Yeah. Am I making you jumpier as we progress? No, I I, I love your energy, oh. and I forget to bring it someday. As soon as the show starts. Oh, no, 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 no. Like, we're off to the races here. It's def- Monday. Defibrillator, let's go. And it was a great weekend. Full. Ooh, I... <laughs> your laptop's just making sounds today. It does. Look at that. Volume down. All right. Volume up on you down on the computer. Okay. Of course, we're going to get into the Leafs losing their second straight game Saturday night, but it was an incredible weekend of emotion. Mm. There's a goofy play the other day uh, in the football game, Patriots and Raiders. I don't know if you saw it, oh where they God. pitched it back. It was tied, just needed to go over overtime. Yeah. That was goofy. But the emotion of the World Cup, I'm sorry, I got to start there. The single most incredible sporting spectacle I think I've ever witnessed. Unbelievable. Agree. Did you? No, no disagreement for me. Okay. That's good. Game because of... you're younger. I... I lived a pretty good one in 1994 playing against Vancouver in a Stanley Cup final, which was really cool to experience. Mm-hmm. But what I witnessed Sunday was like, like I don't know, I, 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 out of everyone's mind. I know. But we probably should have actually clipped the the commentator with the Argentino campeone, <laughs> the, the unbelievable call after the win. I just don't know how sports gets bigger than that moment, really. Like, if you think about just all the juicy narratives going into that game, and there's a lot of people saying that it was the biggest soccer game of all time heading into it, and then have it live up to that hype, and just all the legacy stuff on the line and the amount of swings in the game oh my god the swings so that's the first game my six-year-old the first sporting game that i really had him hooked on and i mean talk about getting your claws into someone if you want to build a sports fan but you know i had him convinced we're rooting for argentina right yeah he kind of wants Messi to cement his legacy by the kicks i mean he couldn't even watch he's hiding behind me unbelievable i have to say that I was really invested in Argentina winning as well. I just, you know, it's one of those things where you want one of the best of all time to get his flowers and get his World Cup, and he did, of course. But I, there's all these moments in the game, but the best moment of the game for me, maybe not the, ah, pretty close, was the save that the Argentinian goaltender made at the end of extra time. With I think it was three minutes. 119 minute mark. There was barely any time left. And he just makes this unbelievable split save on a wide open breakaway, and nothing happens if that doesn't happen. And then you know, it was just I. It was one after another. It was moment after moment. So, so we you're were treated. You, you're supposed to come back from two nothing deficits in hockey, mm-hmm. but not soccer. It happens more than you think. In really? Soccer. Yeah, it does. Like it's it's a it's a pretty dangerous lead in any sport because in hockey you're thinking, "Oh my god, if we're up two, this game's over." Bing, one of the goals in the net and then you're one shot away. It's pretty similar in soccer. I just don't think you expect it to happen after 80 minutes of not oh, getting and nothing. After Argentina controlling 70 yes. minutes of the game as handily as they did, to all of a sudden the, the pressure starts and Mbappe is like an absolute, you know, hurricane. Yeah. He was a one-man Healy force. second volley was oh. off the Ooh. charts. Yeah. And Peter Drury, who called the game, is an absolute artist. I, you know, my TikTok algorithm, I know you guys would be really thrilled to know that I have uh, TikTok, but big TikTok guy. And in my algorithm is literally just Peter Drury calling moments so, in that game now. Mbappe and Messi. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, kind of Trump's magic and... Uh, Jordan? Well... Or Magic uh, and Bird. bird. Magic and Bird. <laughs> you think? I think and... it's a little bit. I, think, I just <laughs> the only thing that I can remember that was close to this level, and it's not even close. It's a different. It's a not an international thing, but to me, Cubs and now Guardians, um, Game Six in 2016. Sorry, Game Seven in 2016. With both of them have these really long droughts on the line, and there's all these swings in the game. And, you know, it goes to extra innings and there's a rain delay and all that. That's the only thing that I can think of that's even closer on the same level. You know what's so cool about this game, though, is that no one failed for it to happen. And, yes, a guy missed a, you know, a couple guys miss a kick in in penalties or whatever. But 
I mean, it is just guys raising their level and raising mm -hmm. their level and raising their level, you know, all the way through. Mbappe with a hat trick. I mean, my God. Imagine shooting. Messi getting the one in extra time alone. He shot four balls into the net. I know. And lost. Oh, well, you don't even, do you feel bad when you go home after that? Yes, like, I got nothing do. else to you give. You feel so. very bad about it. I don't know. One, one more. One more. We promise everybody, well, including. I have uh, a Leafs parallel to this. So okay. When you're done. Just one more. Penalty kicks. Yeah. Just don't you want to see them play until they fall off? I'm I'm in the minority here. You got to end the game. And the game would play. The guys could go forever. I just, it's a it's a finality. It's something. It's a reality of the game. You, shoot can't, it, you shoot, can't squeeze any more out of them. Shoot Is that in, what you're saying? Shoot it in the big net. You're standing on the spot. Shoot it in the big net. I, you, I have you can, no problem So you with can it, convince me of that just because... You know, okay, well, let's see who's in better shape then. Someone's going to make a mistake. Like, it's not going yes. to go forever. I get that. So, yeah, I'm not, like, opposed to that. But for me, that didn't dampen the experience. It was, like, I don't know. It was nice to have that, uh, you know, you mentioned the finality. Like, here, okay. Like, everyone knows the finish line's coming. If yeah. you want to end it before that, go ahead and make it, your push. But it, but. You, you've won a championship on a skills competition and not a soccer pitch. No, and, hey, it's, that's a diff a, it's different with why soccer is it different? than it is with, with why? hockey. Why? Because hockey's much more... It's because, not as traditional yeah, that's as part right. of the game as it's it is It's because it's what you're used to. But also, Kipper, yeah. the, the penalties are an element in game of soccer every game. I mean, not maybe not every, but pretty close yeah, to every it's game. A part a of the game. Kick. Like, there's not a, sh a breakaway shootout shot in every hockey game. We see one every 300 games or something. There so was, it's a little more relevant to the game action. in that game. Right. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. So, you, 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 okay. you swung me over okay. a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> I right. get that. Well, at least it's a piece of it. I but, get that. But I think the pressure on Messi after Mbappe makes his to get his, you know, kick his fourth in the net, mm -hmm. you know, for his, that penalty for him and his legacy, the pressure, the people in the arena, the, uh, they said 1.5 billion people around the globe watched that game. And I just... There was 8 billion on earth? How about Messi like just... Like most of the people? Legitimately, his whole legacy on the line goes up to the penalty spot. He just rolls cheeky. it. I'm like, he oh my God. How would you blast it he in, should, He should never play another soccer game ever. I agree. It he should, should be like just a prize shut it down. Who's like it will never get that dealers. good. Everything you do from here on end Everyone's, is uh, just underneath. Well, but here's, and, and even if, say, if someone catches your record, you it, say, yeah, but I tapped out it, at 35. End or it now. It is. End it now. Here's, here's the interesting thing. Last two things for me. He has to go back to Paris. He plays for Paris. So. With Mbappe. With Mbappe. So that should, be an that should be an interesting one in the locker room. And the second thing for me is I've been obsessed with watching the celebration videos of Argentinians. And, like, there's... Oh, it's man. It's just... I've, I've watched a million over the last 24 hours. I can't get enough. And I think the parallel for me here with the Leafs is that I watch these videos of teams that haven't won in a long time. And I let myself dream... That that's you. ...what this would look like. If, for you know, God forbid that the Leafs ever lifted Lord Stanley's mug, if it would look even close Cuts to what where it's just, Buenos Aires looks like today. Campione, <laughs> I let myself dream on that and just yeah. think about what it would look like. So think, that's think my about playing. Player. Oh my God! <laughs> and and dreaming that. I know. I know. Even for five minutes, yeah. it's everyone's dream. And unfortunately, uh, Saturday night really didn't lead you to any dreaming. Well, I, I was at a wedding on Saturday night, so I watched the game today. And I have to say, after watching the World Cup final, watching a Leafs lose 5-2 uh, after the fact, had a little bit less sting to it, let's just say. <laughs> oh, yeah? A little less boring. Go back and watch Anaheim. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, well, 5-2, mm -hmm. but did it feel like that to you? Because the Leafs did get some some quality looks. Yeah, though, it did. It did. Yeah, I don't know. Did you think the Leafs were better than 5-2? No. Uh, I think they had ample opportunities to to put the puck in the net, yeah. but Lingren was good. He was. Yeah, I mean, he was good. He probably could have handled the Willie one, maybe. You know, he was okay. I'll say he was good, but... Yeah, well, Leafs, you know, you can pull up the numbers and they had a great second period. And do we want to go to the clips on that? Well, well is... Yeah, let, uh, let Sheldon Keefe tell us about the second period. All right. Well, we had a dominant second period. I mean, dominant. I mean, I don't know how many great scoring chances we had. At the very least, it should have been tied going in, into the third, if not us in the lead. And we don't make good on our chances. Our goaltender was good. We don't bear down. So you let the game hang around and... 
you know, like I said, it's, it's tough playing from behind. It's real tough when you come out and you want to get a push in the third and you're pulling out of your net 10 seconds in. Yeah. Tough when you come out and you're pulling it out of your net 10 seconds in. Don't think he loves Sam, Sammy's game all that much? Well, uh, no. Absolutely not. And I'm sure the emotions we're, we're going with him. We'll talk. We'll pick up Samsonov yeah. after we hear from his comments after the game. Uh, it's interesting, you know. It's, I have nervous, a lot of emotion. Yeah, uh, but results not too great. Okay, it's <laughs> good summary. Um, nervous. Don't really like hearing the word nervous. No. 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 Back I his don't. Old team. Okay, I, I get it. Yeah, but. If you're nervous for that game, try playing game one or game two of the Stanley Cup when you are playing on an original six team that hasn't won in 55 years. How are you going to feel then? It's a good point. You know, you'd love the guy who's wildly overconfident and not afraid of any situation rather than the guy who in game 30 of the season was feeling, feeling it a little bit. And, yeah, like, you can be nervous, sure. You can be nervous, but... You can't be as bad as he was in that game after being nervous. It's two just... American Hockey League goals went in on him. Mm-hmm. The first two. The, just, one, the first two in yeah. the, the first period. So the one is that because you were nervous? Because that's that worries me. If those goals go in because you're nervous, mm-hmm. then, yeah, I, I don't want a nervous goalie if I'm Kyle Dubas and my Leaf career hangs in the balance. And you know what it does, too, is it makes other people nervous. Like, Sammy, my boy, nervous today about Samsonov and what it means for him. Yeah, listen, I think there's been a sample size here of him playing really well to start the year. But when he has performances like that around the 10-game mark, which it's gone south for him after the 10-game mark in a lot of different seasons with the with the Capitals, you know, the thoughts cross your mind. And I agree with you, Kipper, hearing him say he's nervous going against his former team, Maybe the whole Ovechkin thing looming over top of him, too. Him breaking the record. I don't know. Maybe that was part of him being nervous, him returning. But, yeah, I, the words nervous are not something you want to hear come out of your goalie's mouth, and I'm pretty sure they would never come out of Matt Murray's mouth. We, we got I'll Sheldon Keefe on a Kipper's Clipper, don't we, on Samson? We do. Yeah. Okay, let's pick it up from there. Yeah. Oh, I mean, I didn't get much of a sense. I don't spend a lot of time with the goalies, you know, on, on game day especially, but you can understand why it would be an emotional uh, return for anybody first game first time back but you got to go through it i mean you can't you can't avoid playing here uh here forever and he's he's played a lot of good hockey for us you know he had some, there were some tough bounces around him here tonight but you know we didn't take care of the puck well enough either on especially goals 3 4 and 5 okay so he hangs the first two on him yep yep and then he hangs the next three on his team but I think Sheldon said it, really, without saying it. He's got to go through it. Mm-hmm. The only question is, is what else are you going to have to go through it with him if, in fact, he finds himself in the net in critical mm-hmm. games down the stretch or in the first round? Well, this is the fear, and it was the fear going into the season and, and remains the fear. It's just no one going into the season said Murray and Samsonov are the best tandem in the nhl they have played like the second best tandem in the nhl thus far so i think it's reasonable that their performance was going to decline at some and, point and you're giving the title to so far to boston okay all mark and swim but you know they've been very close to the best and so you get in this situation it's like you want to have some for forgiveness for them but there's a part of me that's like i was worried at the start of the year about this duo are they going to regress wildly and we're going to have the jack campbell effect from here on out and then we're panicking by March. They need someone else. You know, the worst case scenario, wreckage of the future, as a certain program calls it. No, I, I mean, it was a gamble coming into the season for a reason. Like, there's not like it was, a, you know, the sure thing, but they've been a sure thing to this point. But I think a lot of this just has to do with measuring it against last year, fellas, right? Which is a thing sure. that it's a completely different situation. We hope. Different people. Different people, different things. But I think there's a lot of Leaf fans that think back to what happened after December last year and are having bad memories. Right, because I think the goaltending's been pretty. I guess has it been two straight games? Well, come on, we're we're talking about since that California road trip that this team's had their foot on the pedal yeah. for a very long stretch here, and I include the goalies. Mm-hmm. But maybe what we're witnessing is a little bit of coming back to earth, a little bit, mm-hmm. and 
I'm certainly not ready to write these goalies off just yet here with yeah. but there's a there's a natural dip to to question it a little bit. I, I gotta think we'll get more of a feel for not just the goaltenders, but the rest of the team after Tuesday night when Tampa Bay comes into town who are are playing very well again. Oh yeah, Tampa's just red so, hot. Won, five won, five in a row. So just, oh, yeah, five in a great. Just you know, get away from Samsonov. They're they're to me the one thing that I did see Saturday night is mm -hmm. just a little bit of a, I don't know if it's an exhale, but just a little bit of the foot coming off the pedal a little bit. Mm -hmm. And if we go to Samsonov, I'll, I'll go to John Tavares, yeah. who I think has been absolutely terrific out of the gate. Yep. But. That was the worst game I've I've seen so far out of JT and with Pucker with energy everything with yeah everything okay and I might put energy at the top of it just he had no legs he didn't have any push and not the drive that I've seen and maybe it's just because he's been on such a a, a long stretch of of hard hockey. Mm -hmm. I've, I've watched him battle. Like all see, we've all watched him battle and we all talked season. About how him and Mitch are getting D zone starts every other year. He's been ozone. And I just saw, I didn't see the energy out of him. And I, I didn't see, uh, the leg strength. I didn't see like 11 when, games. Now he has two goals over the last when, 11. When you see John at his best, it, it is his, his legs are there. Yeah. And I didn't see any legs out of him. Saturday night. And you know what the, the biggest tipping point for me off when John doesn't have any legs? Hmm. Face-offs. Mm -hmm. Can't win face-offs. Yeah. He's typically been an over 50% guy. I don't know. Yeah. Was it bad on Saturday? or was he, I didn't notice that. Yeah, all, I, all I know is they had a couple of power play opportunities. Yeah. Chasing and down the ice. JT loses draws, and now it's a, a minute and 30 power play. Yeah. Yeah, that's the worst. Do you want to talk about the power play? Yeah, for sure. And... I'll I'll start on win faceoffs yeah. off the power play. Yeah, I, I, it, again, it's crucial. I think John, John's probably been at a fifty percent pace, and some nights he's he looks like the best uh, faceoff guy on the planet. Yep. Uh, oh, last like Babs, Saturday night he was dreadful. Yeah, I look at it, but yeah, yeah. he I, I didn't notice that, but that's so that that's the first thing I see out of mm -hmm. a power play is. Give yourself a chance with puck possession oh, off the huge. face. Off. It's huge. And, and you know, one of the things that I wildly disagree with analytics on is they'll tell you that power plays are not that, or sorry, face offs are not that crucial just in general that, you know, it, it all kind of evens out after seven seconds of play or whatever, but not power plays. Power yeah. plays, it's like you need the hockey puck. What do you think his face off percentage was on Saturday night? I want to say 35%. Forney? I, since I didn't notice it and I'm here in Kipper, uh, I'm going to go 34 and 0.9. 25%. Yeah. yeah there you not, go. Not a good he, night. Uh, no, it's, it's a bad night. 12, he won. What is he on the year, though? Can you find us that? Yeah, for sure I can. Thank you. One second. Yeah. He is 51.3 for his career yeah. this he, season. He is 60.6. 60%, .6 60%. Yeah. this season. Mm -hmm. So he's got to be near the top of the league there. Yeah. So when I see his... when I see oh, him, I lied to you. 59.8. Uh, All right. When, when I see John protecting pucks mm -hmm. and... Uh, rolling off of guys in front of the net for great positioning, and you you know that his leg strength's there, mm -hmm. then you know he's going to be a dangerous guy. Yeah, wonder um, you know wonder if it is just it was a lot of use early in the season, too many minutes, or if it's just the natural progression of a season of a guy who's in his late thirties or sorry mid early thirties actually he's not thirty one or something. I feel like he's ninety. Listen, whether you're. You know, John's not the uh, the most natural skater, so he's yeah. got to work his ass off yep. to get from point A to point B. But even with the natural skaters, I mean, it, it really helps over the course of 82 games, but mm -hmm. it, they'll even have lulls. Yeah. And they'll even have stretches when they just, you know, don't have it. And I think maybe a, a Christmas break will come in handy to him. Sure. The other guy that I think is is feeling it a little bit, Mark Giordano. Yeah. Not, not uh, Saturday good. night, another guy who I go has maybe taken the foot off the gas pedal for very good reasons. Yeah, he's almost 40, and yeah. he's been playing some nights 22, 23 minutes. To me, I watched him Saturday night, and, and he felt those minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I didn't mind him much. You know, the times I did notice him, I thought he was okay. But, you know, one thing that has changed is his minutes have gone down since Brody has come back. You're right, pre-Brody, 
that was way too much for Gio. He's getting buried when when you didn't have enough guys. Since Brody's been back, he's playing, I think it's 1845 a night. Would you want him less than that? Yes. Yeah. And they will when Morgan comes back. Yeah. One more on the guy left side. Then, yeah. Which will help him. Get him to 17 or but something like that. I, I didn't like his play off the Hathaway goal to start. That, that, that's the game right there. Yeah. They try to go D to D. He goes up the wall and Jensen steps in in front of uh, Bunting mm -hmm. and then he he beats Giordano. Yeah. How, how many times that happened this year with the Leafs with they getting scored on within the first 10 seconds of a period? It felt like Every every game during their bad stretch there, it was the first 10 seconds of a period or first 20 or first minute. It's they actually, would go in the net. Early in the season, we talked a lot about bad starts mm -hmm. or slow starts to period, and is this the coach's fault, and if not. So then, and then they were wonderful yes. for a long run of hockey at So it. I think something to All Kip, or nothing. Kipper's point about them maybe feeling a little tired, a little fatigued here, that some of their bad, their bad uh, habits are trickling back you know, in from their and, cold stretch, right? Again, and listen, I, I kind of brought it up a little bit Friday, but this is where I think Sheldon needs to go and identify certain things. And if if Tavares is having a bad night, well, don't let him take a face off anymore. When you got 34 out there, you don't have to win it to like, the wall. Why does he keep throwing him out there? He's having a tough night. Make the adjustment. Yep. Get him out of the face off circle. Yeah. So, I mean, stuff like that. Yeah, I, I, I think it's, simple. it's interesting that they, they're so concerned with handedness and the side of the ice. Like, you know, Matthews is out there and a very good face-off guy by his own right. So, Do they feel like it's going to piss JT off? He's going to lose them? I don't know. It's one of those things. If a guy is, whatever, two and four or two and five in the circle, are you ready to pull the plug and say he's not going to be 500 on the night? Like, you know, I... It's I agree with you there, Bourne. It's hard for the, for a guy that's almost 60% this year to be like, oh, he's lost two in a row, better get him out of there. Like, yeah. you kind of have to trust that he's going to find his level, and he just had a bad night. He got cleaned out. So he they won, go... He won three draws of the 12 he took. They go 0 for 3 against Anaheim. They go 0 for 3 against New York, and they went 0 for 2 Saturday night. Power play? Is that Power saying, play. Yeah. And we got to look at five forwards. Did you see... I just wanted to, just as a reference... Uh, Matthews, what do you think his percentage was on, in the faceoff on on uh, Saturday night? Oh, probably seventy 50, or something. Like Eighty percent. Eighty percent. Yeah. yeah. He, uh, Pro he probably could have tapped old ninety one on the shoulder and said, "I'm going to handle this he one." He took fifteen draws and one twelve of them. So <laughs> pretty good. Stuff you know what's funny him. though, and you know, Kipper, I'm sure you went through this too. I don't know if you played much center, but like some guys just match up well or poorly against another guy. You know, I remember seeing this in the minors. Byron Fraze was on our team. He was very good in faceoffs. Oh, they, they got all the records there. What's that? face-offs oh yeah against against, against who yeah. and yeah but i remember guys yeah. coming in phrases one of yeah. them saying you know tanner richard and they he owns me and we're looking you know what does this guy do that sometimes the guy's just got your number i don't know if that was just a bad matchup for jt or what five forwards on a power play mm. uh, those of you who hated it raise your hands i'm i'm putting mine up i'm gonna be that guy who's like i didn't see enough it's still a small sample that's gonna be me here sorry Is it? yeah i'll put my hand up <laughs> Yeah, I, I, it's just to me, it's, I, I guess it's just that it's not traditional and immediately I get my back up about it. Like I want one D-man out there at least, but at the same time, what's the point of having a D-man out there if you're trying to score and this you have is, a guy? I think the, it needs to get enough run and it's never going to get enough run. This is the biggest reason why, and I don't even have to watch any of it, Yeah, is because the first thing I think of is the reason why you have five forwards out there is because your defense suck. That's it. That's the only reason. It is and the if I'm you're six making. defensemen on the bench now watching everybody, the message is clear. They're better at that than you are, in my opinion, as of right this minute. But in, you, and I'm but offended. So I'm offended. Yeah, well, you're offended then. Sit on the bench when the letter, I mean, you can't argue All that right. the five guys out there are better at okay. it. You know, the only case yeah. you can make is the guy like... Here's the problem, though, is that... You, th you think these guys are so sensitive. Yeah, they are. They well, are. And they're they... sucks, right? Well, and well, they're babies. They, well, then they need they to pout. not be sucks and babies and pouts. Yeah, good luck. Go find go find the perfect hockey player that, <laughs> that can do what they can do yeah. and still not, at times, pout. And well, they are. It's a natural thing. Well, then let them pout, though. Uh, then you got a problem as a head coach. I don't know. Yeah, I just I, these guys are grown-ups. What then, are we talking about? And then they don't score, and then 
maybe it's Morgan or maybe it's Sandine where he gets thrown out there for the last 15 if I were seconds. Sandine, I'd be pissed for sure. And you know what they say to the coach? You go out there and score the with 15 seconds on the power play. Yeah, I know. And then you're on. You're the guy. Now the second unit comes out. By theory, I agree with you a hundred percent. Yeah, I know. You're you're trafficking in reality. Reality I is, I know these guys. Yeah. And I know that I've seen it before. I've sat beside them before. Of course. They will turn around and go, screw you. But at the end of the day, when they say screw you, your coach puts you on the ice yeah. and they try their hardest because they're professionals. So let them say screw the coach. Yeah. Here's the point. I don't, I'm not saying this in defense of five forwards because five forwards, every time I've seen it in practice, which is the American League and now a little bit in the NHL, it's bad. It has not worked. There's chances to go the other way. It's a bad spot. Did Keith do it in with you guys, the Marlies? Yeah, and I've told a story a few times where okay. we like, Tell it again. like the third game in a row where we tried it, we had given up two or three shorthanded goals. Oh, really? And Dubis came in, I think, before the third game and said, "We're not doing that anymore." And Keith said, "We got to give it some run." We did it again. We got scored on oh, again. Oh yeah, he's done and that. it was We're like good it here. was the big blow up of the two of them post game when. Dubas is yelling at him for doing it, and Sheldon's calling him Big Mouth, and they're you know they're mad about it. And like, Kyle's the progressive guy, but when it doesn't work, but it, here's I just think you need the forward to play that D role long enough to get used to it, but you're never going to let it go long enough because you're going to give up some shorties. So maybe this is why Keith was like, we should try Marner at D. Right. Because his whole idea was to, do it all, back yeah, there. was to do this on the power play. But I did it in college. I played D on the power play, and I got cooked all the time. It was terrible. It was not effective. On a scale, though, <laughs> one to five, where's your backward skating? <laughs> yeah, I found out real quick. <laughs> I, I feel like I did that on this show, but I shot it into Mason Raymond's shin pads, who was playing for Minnesota Duluth, and I'm starting at a stop and chasing Mason Raymond, who beat me by a zone and a half back to my net. <laughs> He's just like a oh, kid. he's a speedster too. Oh yeah, yeah that was his chance. number one skill was skating. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he was so he fast. Could have missed the shot, gotten a rebound, played with it <laughs> like he was playing rebound by himself or something. But anyway, uh, I just, I, I just find it hard to believe that here we are at at the Christmas break almost, yeah. and now you're going to develop five forwards to the point where they will be absolutely ready in the first round of the playoffs. No, but I wonder if they're like, let's say Riley's hurt or whatever. Is this an option for us? Yeah, and good. this would be the time of year to figure it out. Did he try it against Anaheim? Or did he wait for the Rangers and the yeah, Washington true. Capitals on the road? Yeah, well, were they down to when they went to it? Or no, the plan was to use it going into the game, right? Mm -hmm. That was yeah the original plan. Yeah, if you're Sandine and Riley's out and this is your chance to, you know, do your earn a spot, it's probably very frustrating. And I I'm looking, I don't think the improvement you get by going five forwards is worth it. And I think that I'm looking at the standings now here. And listen, I know it's only the Leafs have only lost a couple games in a row here. It's not the end of the world. But Tampa's coming here, right? Like they are getting hot now and you're looking at the standings and they, when, what were they behind the Leafs a week ago? They were 10 points or whatever, eight points behind the Leafs. They've now, they're now three points back of you and with two games in hand. Yeah, with two games in hand. So, so may maybe the time for experimenting is not now. No, maybe it's now. It's now. still now. Well, still now. they're you, playing Tampa you, no matter what. You, you, yeah, but home ice <laughs> matters, Borny. You went through an amazing stretch of what? 18 with points, consecutive points. What was 15, it? 15, yeah. 15. And you look at, who provided all the offense, mm -hmm. and it came from your forwards. your forwards. There's you can't. No one's scoring back there. There's no offense coming from your back end. I know, it was funny when Lilligren got back in. He shot two in the net, and everyone's like, "Nice to have a guy there who can is. shoot it in from the back and end." Where are they in goals? Mm, hold on. Oh, they're gonna be last. The, goals by line. D. They, I would imagine they're oh, last. Like I don't almost know. dead last. Yeah, that's not really a good thing. For a team, uh, a top five team in the NHL. Let me just do a quick perusal of goals here by D. Kipper. The top scoring D on the team is Sandine with two, Lilligren with two, Gio with one, Brody one, yeah. Hall one. That puts him, what, 29th in the league? It's got to be last. I just can't imagine having less goals than that. So that, to me, it's a bit of a, of a white flag for Sheldon to tell everybody that uh, we're not getting any production from the back end. Therefore, I have to go with five.
Or is it or is it Kyle's? Kyle's call. To me, no, it doesn't. Well, I think it would be Sheldon's call. But to me, I don't think it matters if it's a signal to the other team has stats too. Like they know they don't get action from back there. I just think the difference between having who did they add to the top unit? Bunting. But is, like, is Bunting going to help you more than Sandine? How many more is he going to get? I don't know. But, but then you just there's one thing to keep throwing them out there and hoping that it'll turn, mm-hmm. and then there's another thing to say, uh, no. Um, no, we're going to sit you down now. So what do you want to see him do? Uh, get somebody, trade for somebody. Yeah, okay. Now we're talking. Yeah. You don't think Connor Timmons is the guy? Uh, yeah, listen, uh, what's he got? Five points, six, six points? Six points in six seven, games yeah. or seven games? I mean, things are going well, but I don't know if I'm going to, again, take him from an Arizona organization where he was not – a regular player and turn him into this 20 minute guy who can provide yeah. offense by the first round of the playoffs. Like Can't, it's not realistic. No, it's not. It's not. And you can see them wanting to it to work out right. To be the smartest guys in the room and find this guy, by the way, Ovechkin absolutely gave him a story to tell when he's retired about playing against Alex Ovechkin, putting him into the Capitals bench yeah. cleanly. Just, just, just as a quick aside with the Leafs defensive scoring, there are 10 defensemen in the league with more goals than the Leafs decor totally. Are you kidding me? Yeah. The Leafs have six from their defensemen and then there's 10 guys that have seven and above. In the oh, 10 players that yes. have seven and above. Yeah. Oh, I thought yeah. you were saying there's only 10 teams. No, no, there's 10, there's 10 guys in the league <laughs> that have more goals than the least decor on for the back okay. end. Okay. So, so uh, the other thing that stood out for me Saturday night is how, led by the Ovechkin hit on Timmons is yeah. their physical team. Yeah. And the Leafs cannot go shoulder to shoulder with a team like that they're gonna have to outskill you they should get rid of someone little like Mulgan for a physical guy don't you think so do you remember friday show mm-hmm. i asked I you anything. i used to drink if, a lot <laughs> if there was a certain experiment going on right now and if the experiment should end was it mulligan is that what it, was? <laughs> it sounds familiar yeah. i asked you guys on friday show when is the mulligan experience or uh project i don't know how i phrased it over yeah. and now You've we have Malgan our answer right out of the league <laughs> what was that You've been Malgan right out of the league <laughs> no, i don't know where that came from thanks derek <laughs> Uh, we know the the Malgan uh, experiment is over. Yeah, and you know what? In retrospect, now that it's like today, Yarn Croc is back, and today Malgan got traded. The Malgan experience was probably over a week and a half ago, and they were like, "Okay, no, we agree." No, no, no. It was alive and well Saturday night. Was it? Oh yeah, you don't absolutely. Think it was like, listen, Colorado. As soon as we get Yarn Croc back, we'll finalize this deal. But we just need the body right now. I would think that when I watched. The Leafs break out, I believe, on the third goal. It went Marner off the wall. It went through uh, Matthews. The backhand pass from Kuznetsov. Yes. <laughs> what a pass. But, but it, was, it was Marner to Mulligan on the tape, and this guy doesn't even have his stick down. Yeah. And then within five seconds, it's the turnover on the in the neutral zone, and it's back in your net. That's when the experiment was over They're for like, Mulligan. Seen enough. It, seen enough. And it felt like he played a lot in that game. And I just went and checked, and he did play a lot. He played over 15 minutes in that game. Yes. Well, if you play him on the second line, there's going to be games that happen, and particularly I, when you're chasing I, the game and looking if, for if, offense. If it wasn't Marner that maybe got to somebody and said, enough. <laughs> Absolutely yeah. enough. Yeah, I'd rather retire than play best another right shift in the league? with Mulligan. <laughs> <laughs> Tapped out on playing if, with that guy. If Marner didn't say that, yeah. uh, then somebody else and, said it. And listen, I would completely understand it if I'm Marner. Like, have you seen how good I've been playing? Like, this is the this is the left winger that you're you yeah, got I, me with here. I, I got 23 games a consecutive streak playing with guys like this. Well, and if you're the Leafs, you're going. That's yeah, great. We can put anyone with you, and you'll put it together for us. Yeah, and tea times too in April. <laughs> <laughs> like a fan for another team sometimes. Hey, uh, so what do we hear about? Uh, they traded him for Dryden Hunt, correct, from Colorado, and it's going to come in not as skilled as Mulligan, 
No, though he did have 120 points in junior one year. We haven't seen any signs of that. Nope. Oh, American League, he had 23 goals twice. Sounds like my career. <laughs> I was going to say, is this, is this Kipper Big we're scoring talking about? Junior. If they want to win a cup in game seven. I that's scored okay. 24 with the Hershey Bears yep. and then turned into a mucker and a grinder well, and an energy guy. You should love Dryden Hunt. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to love him a lot more than Mulligan. Yes, I can confirm that. He is top 10 in hits per 60 minutes. Good enough for me. He doesn't runs- sound like a typical Dubis guy. No. But the pendulum swinging on what he needs. And Saturday night was another example. I, 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 I don't want to see a team run me. And that's mm-hmm. what essentially, when, when you see a guy like Ovechkin, and again, at age 37, it just it's mind-boggling that this guy not only does it, wants to do it Mm -hmm. like it's unbelievable that that guy's got the energy for everything he's gone through to still go out there and hit timmons like a bag of feathers yeah yeah no it's a huge hit it is it's not just the physical ability it's the continued desire to chase down the bodies that is i think one of the most electrifying type of hits for the guy goes into the the bench great and I, i don't feel like i've seen a lot of those in the last couple of years, but God, he just got him right in the sweet spot, hands on the logo, straight into the bench. And there's nothing better than the guys in the bench looking at him, being like, "I'm not helping you for one second. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> get your own, get you know, the hell out of here. Hug back, yeah, just so get you the hell make out it here. harder if you can." I love that kind of hit. But that's why I think you go and try to, you know, change it up a little bit with Hunt. But if you're that, that so I'm just to represent yeah. the conversation that's happening about this trade on social media anyway is the Leafs don't need another guy who doesn't score. They don't need another good defensive player. They don't the bottom six need scoring, they, Kipper. They, they need scoring. No, no, they need a guy like Hunt to go and, and do what Ovechkin did to somebody <laughs> just a little bit. Did you like him hitting your boy Pasternak, that clip? I like, did. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. did. And I don't think that happens I, I a hope, ton. But. I hope there's a few more looks. You know, like that. You know what? Like a lot is, of people are he, comparing he, him to Zach Aston Reese. Yeah. But I was saying, if you could have Zach Aston Reese with a pulse, this would be no disrespect. Aston, Aston, Aston Reese was Reese the only one that tried to hit Saturday yes, night. Yes, and listen, I, I've actually been very impressed with him as a guy on the cheap in that role. He's been good. But yeah, it'd be nice to have He's something a little more. bringing a ton of energy, unfortunately. Right. But he doesn't have that that personality to go above and beyond that. Yeah. Uh, but. At least he's trying out there. I didn't see anyone else try to finish a check at all. They 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 want to outskill you, mm-hmm. and that's the only way. But boys, like, do you, do you envision like the Leafs playing, say, a, a team like Washington and physically being able to withstand that type for six or seven games? It would be very challenging, boys, especially. And guess who's no not even playing Wilson. Yet. That's exactly right. no Tom Wilson Saturday night. I will say once again. It was nice to watch the Cavs play the Leafs without Tom Wilson again. Because it's just you're constantly worried about him when he's on the ice. I know they threw the body around a little bit, but, like, there's no one There's just no answer for Tom Wilson because so, no, he stays on I mean. the ice. Is, is Hunt maybe the start of maybe grabbing a few more that can kind of push back a little bit? What, you know, what roster spots? How many roster spots can they turn over, and what difference will it make? So they're missing, I think we're in consensus, they're missing a left winger to play in the top six. Mm-hmm and a defenseman of some variety who can hit a body. So that's a place you can get more physical. I would like a defenseman that can hit the net. You know, like, you think you're missing that a lot? Uh, no, just, oh, just score, score a goal. A goal. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, hit the mesh with the puck. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, you think Klingberg's going uh, to be the I, answer to I just, what Kipper's talking about? I think the not being able to score from the back end is a super underrated story from this season. I really do think it matters. And when you, you need that little bit of contribution here and there when your top four guys aren't going. Yeah. They don't even get shots from the top all that much. It all is generated down low for mm-hmm. the Leafs. So, yeah, Dray- Dryden Hunt, points in junior, physical guy. How many games has he got under his belt? He was with the Rangers, too. The yeah. Rangers kind of liked him. Yeah, no, There was times when I saw places. him up in the lineup with the Rangers. He's, he's played 193 games in his career. He's got uh, 14 goals. Um, 28 assists. And that year you talk about with the Rangers was the most he played was his 76 games. He had 17 points, 52 pims. 
Yeah, in training, he's played five playoff games in the NHL. Like in the American League, we're looking at 23 goals in 58 games, 23 goals in 51 games. Like he obviously can handle the puck is the reason I bring that up. Yeah. You know, like he's not a and it, meatball. It's, it's, he's six foot 195. It's money in, money out. They both make the same amount, right? Yeah, 750. 750, or 50 or 750, 760. Yeah. Colorado's looking for a guy that can maybe drop in every once in a while in the top six. Presumably they're so injured, they just need someone yes. they're hoping can score more. With a little bit more this skill. Guy can find it. Yeah. So at the very least, I think the Leafs have got themselves a maybe a, a poor man's Obey Kubel. Yeah. <laughs> Don't say that. A rich man's Obey Kubel. Oh, a rich hope. man. A very rich man. <laughs> Obey Kubel. Yeah. I like having someone 27 years old in the fourth line. A guy who's got some experience, can still play with energy. Like, you don't have to be Patrick Marlowe or Jason Spezza, and you don't have to be an up-and-coming rookie. Just go do your thing. Give us the best year of career. I like here. it. And he I'm good. Change is just for the sake of a change. I like it. And he probably knows what he's coming in to do. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah, they're we got enough people shooting in the net. You go run into people and forecheck. Probably, I would imagine Sheldon keeps going like to have a, a chat with him like pretty a, quickly about the a, role that he needs to do. Kyle Clifford. Exactly. And Healthy. When, you know, not a wear and tear Clifford, a, a younger version. Healthier good version. defensively, too. His numbers, you know, Maybe not, he not kill a happens. penalty here and there. Love that. Let's see. We'll have to look that up at well, the break. All right, we're going to take a quick break. Stellectricity is coming on board here. Gord Stellick, Leaf Nation, pre and post. We're going to have him talk about the Leafs, whether or not Samson, Samsonov is making him nervous like he's making our Sammy. All right. All right. More after the break. Real Kipper and Bourne.
This is Real Kipper and Board on Sportsnet 590 The Fan. Big holiday plans there, JB. Yeah, we do the uh, we alternate years who's family, so we're it's a Gillies year, so we'll be in Long Island. I'm gonna go to a game in the 23rd, see these Washington Capitals. Oh, yeah, you got a little uh, OV history, maybe. Oh, yeah, it's what do you possible. Think? I never thought of that. You know what they have? In, you had a couple chances Saturday night. I'm sure did. You know what they have at UBS Arena is ice level suites. You know, you come and go behind, you come up from below. Listen. Kind of, all these new rinks. Yeah. People are barely watching the games. Oh, man. There's so much going on. <laughs> so much going on. Everybody's talking. Everybody's schmoozing. Well, and like those seats become another thing for corporate people to buy up and send the people who don't actually care but want to say they went to a game. So, you know, going to go do that. <laughs> you guys got a little bit of that experience at uh, Scotiabank Arena and mm -hmm. Drake's. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, and club. Coming Coming in, by the way, uh, when I come back with full Islanders propaganda, like I'm going to be with Ledecky, with the owner of the team. Oh, I'm just going to have, we're, we're going to get all the info, and I'm going to come and be like, have you ever noticed Brock Nelson's the best player in the league? <laughs> <laughs> You're going to be trading players by then? <laughs> yeah, we'll see. I'll see what I can do. I'll lean on, yeah. You it, and Lou? It has been a rough little stretch for the, the Isles, so. Although they did get a win the other night. All right, where's our buddy Gord Stellick? Let's find out. Kippy, Justin, how you guys doing? Gordon, I'm just I'm about Nobody to go told caroling. me you were there waiting. I wouldn't have had to. Uh, I wouldn't have, you Let know, me ramble. I wouldn't have gone on. I don't really care about, you know, JB's Christmas plans. <laughs> I would have come to you. Well, I'm out there. I mean, the big news, Ken Dryden back with the Leafs, unless I haven't found my glasses, so I'm just trying to <laughs> cover all that. Just that, that, caught, that came from nowhere, huh? Did not uh, see that coming. What do you think yeah. about the the blockbuster trade, Mulligan, for your friend, uh dryden hunt well it's like uh, i don't i don't imagine i don't know do you play chess do you play chess justin i mean i'm capable of it but i wouldn't say i yeah. actively play it so it's like you know i take your white pawn and you take my black pawn right yeah that's the you know the, pawns the, the can, queens and hey. the and the horsey guys and the castles and you, everything you, the rooks they're all you make it sound like <laughs> pawns aren't valuable at all you know they turn into queens right well, they no, they don't. They can they can help you capture the queen. They can't, but you know the the big gun is still the queen. Austin Matthews is still well the queen, whatever you know. When Mitch <laughs> Marner derailed, the queen, <laughs> or, 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 whatever. Or the, the metaphor is lost. Hey, 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 yeah, stick to checkers, buddy. <laughs> The horsey guy's Rasmus Sandin because he can go, you know, two forward, one sideways, and that. So, you know, so, hey, I don't know. Be you no know, Kippy and Justin. Like, always say, everybody wants, first of all, there's been no block, there are no blockbuster trades, Harley. There hasn't been one yet. I mean, you know, we had like Jack Eichel last year and things like that for certain reasons. But if you're Kyle, if you're Kyle Dubas or any general manager, whatever moves you make, if more often than not you incrementally improve your team, then that's how you get better, whether it's a trade, whether it's a draft, whether it's developing a player, whether it's calling somebody up, whether it's, you know, the, the roster or rearranging the line. So, you know, I, I mean, but so, okay, so we're talking about M Mulgan, the chance on the top six just didn't happen. He's got to be that kind of player, so it seems. And in Dryden Hunt's case, a bit more sandpaper, you know, not exactly like, a, you know, a, a ton of sandpaper, but but a bit different that way. So a, a bit of a different option because really they don't they don't have a ton of sandpaper. They got they got, you know, they've got Kyle Clifford somewhere. They got Wayne Simmons still Wayne Simmons still that are kind of heavyweights if needed, but they, they don't seem to really have a regular place for them. So what did you see Saturday night? A team that just missed some opportunities to win a hockey game, a team that didn't go shoulder to shoulder with the Washington Capitals. Thus, you get you, 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 you trade for a more physical uh, hunt. Um, you know, where where does Saturday Night lie with you? Yeah, I don't. I can't see that uh, a trade predicated on that. I mean, you, you do see like Ryan Reeves what he's done in Minnesota in a short period of time, and he's a way different player than Dryden Hunt. But they, you know, they needed some of that, and you know, the Wild seem at least in the short term have got that. But you know, Kippy, um, so. Okay, a lot of this is due after the phenomenal run that they've had. Uh, the one worry is, and I'm, I'm, worry is a bit too strong a word, but you start to look and say, how many of the games 
I love Danny Gallivan, so I'll use the word scintillating goaltending. I mean, the Leafs had a run of incredible goaltending. So, I mean, Washington, in some ways, was it much different than the Dallas game, how they started when they beat them, shut them out for nothing, but, you know, got killed on the first power play, gave up three chances when they were when they when uh, they had a power play three shorthanded chances to Dallas you know that kind of thing so yeah I I, I just it, it, it was the kind of game that they just they hadn't played the previous 15 they're they're due for a couple of those so uh, I mean we we're kind of looking would, would Ovi get the hat trick I don't think we really expected Gustafson to be the guy so it was something we haven't seen of late just one of those games that you kind of just oh it wasn't it wasn't very compelling and you're you're I mean they're going to happen let's face it the guy I I don't I don't read a lot into it Gord, uh, you know, I, I wanted to weigh in on the hunt thing before, uh, you know, we'll, we'll go back to the hockey game, but I, I wanted to ask your opinion because you've built NHL teams before, and I wanted to get a sense if you think teams are better, better off having sort of guys who do a little bit of everything or specialty guys. Because to me, Hunt is a guy, he's more of a specialty guy, right? You know what he does, he's going to hit and forecheck and whatever. And I was saying to McKee before the show, I'd rather have... You know, instead of having 10 Swiss Army knives to build a treehouse, I'd rather have a hammer and, a, you know, all, all the tools, whatever other tools you like, French, pliers, all that sort of stuff. Do you think it makes more sense for the, the Leafs to have specialists like Hunt than guys who kind of do a little bit of everything? Yeah, especially like on the fourth line. Like, I mean, you, you want to get the one or two guys that can play on any line. That's kind of neat. But, I mean, they have to be a, a, a better than either a Mulgan or a Hunt. So, like I said, in Mulgan's case, you know, if, if he, he's not – He's not Hunt is a better third or especially fourth line player than Mulligan, who, you know, uh, is supposed to have some scoring ability, you know, what have you. And it really hasn't been borne out. So I, I, I agree with you there at some point. Again, I'm not going to go back to the chess analogy, but I mean, about having different kind of different kind of pieces that you could plug in. So, it, uh, uh, you know, money's pretty well awash you know, incrementally different, pretty well awash. And, and I, I think, yeah, that's probably, you know, I thought Blackwell was a nice ad last year, but of course he got too much money to go elsewhere yeah. in the off season. So, I mean, you know, those are these, as you know, Kippy, you want to stand the cup with as much as with Mark Messier, but whether it's guys like you or everybody else around the New York Rangers on that, on that third and fourth line. We're talking to Gord Stella, Leaf Nation pre and post game. Uh, we heard from Samsonov after the game, he admitted he was a little bit, nervous uh, does that make you nervous like it makes our sammy nervous that he was nervous <laughs> oh sam wasn't that what, nervous what what did sammy offered jack campbell an eight-year contract last year at 12.5 right he was going to match mcdavid right to keep jack campbell in Correct. toronto was that not right guys well it's, yeah you nailed it gordo i think so. yeah 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 so okay so sam's i love sammy's the great part is that's the fan savvy right and that's the best part is how the ups and downs and you ride that kind of roller coaster so I, I like guys being human, okay? So rather than the stand pad answer all the time, admit, you know, admit you got a little bit of butterflies and all that, th you know, what uh, that, that part I'm okay with. Because sometimes that comes up with your best game ever, and other times, you know, it didn't work out so much. It, the problem is if it happens time and time again and you're in the playoffs and that's the thing. So I, I, I'm, I'm okay with him being human and, and, having, and having a human kind of feeling. Like, like, Kippy, first time you played your old team, what was that like? My first game in the uh, NHL was against guys that just finished, like, having a 30-day training camp with right. and living with them every day and driving with them. And it was ridiculous that I thought I could play that game. But, uh, yeah, I, I, guess, I guess there's always nerves a little bit. The question is, did they affect you so much that uh, did they play into the first couple of goals scored? That's all. Oh well, yeah, and and you know, and, and and Justin, I've always said that, like when you get drafted, and mm -hmm. I think it's still the same. It's kind of like your flag, right? Like you know, it, there's just so much pride. It's your franchise, and yeah. when you get traded the first time, like it really hurts, and then it becomes a business, right? Then after that, you're used to it. You can leave on your own volition as a free agent. You you get traded two, three, four times. You never know what's going to happen. But I, I think the first time just has a has a a little bit of a little bit of that element. So. You know, in, in, in Kippy and Justin, I, I, I did that factor into those goals. Like it was, it wasn't a great game. So if that was one of the factors, fine. It wasn't a, a, a good game at all for a guy that so far has very pleasingly given given the Toronto Maple Leafs a lot of real solid goaltending. For sure. What What are your thoughts um, at the other end of the rink on them going away from Sandine on power play one and going with a five forward look, Gord? Don't like it. Never have. Okay. Never have. Yes. And, um, <laughs> one for me. Yeah, 
I'm not I'm not Rasmus Sandin's agent either. I just I never have. Never have. I've actually liked, you know, I I, I just like the way it's funny. It's great. I've loved the way Sandin's embraced the opportunity. A veteran like Giordano's embraced the extra ice time. A guy like Justin Hall, who really seemed to be struggling, has played well when they really needed him to. And yeah, so I I, I uh, to, so so Justin, I, yeah, I've never been big on the five forwards. So Gord, we were just mentioning earlier in the show that uh, there, there's no offense coming from the back end. We can, Morgan Riley should be back maybe in another week, week and a half. Uh, but is 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 that enough? Feeling like Morgan's coming back. Equivalent yeah, to well, maybe making a trade, or do they got to go outside? And is it is it a, a hulking defenseman they need, or do they need someone that could push the pace of play for offense? Um, is it, are we getting back the twenty goal Morgan? Like you know the the Morgan Riley that scored twenty the one mm-hmm. season. I and and Kippy. Um, and again, I'll go back to your Ranger days, but there was no cap, so I can't really go back then. But basically, at the trade deadline did both like you're talking about did a little bit of everything right you try to you try to add depth and try to add plug more holes so they could they could use both of those i think what and what we've discussed before is that the nick felino type trade is not needed anymore like giving up a first round pick for you know that kind of hired gun you know it's 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 got to almost be patrick kane now or something like that i don't know like it's Oof. it really does it has to be like when brian leach came over you know you know that that kind of thing if you're going to be giving away things of that magnitude uh, you know i think otherwise you know, from within and just hoping uh, I keep using Nick Paul as the example because he's a big reason the Leafs got eliminated. But, you know, one or two Leaf players in the playoffs and Kerfoot's the guy that's, you know, geez, come on. He's got to be a guy that gives you more offense, particularly at the money he's making. It's just those kind of guys have to come up with some offense in the playoffs in particular. And I thought that was one of the, you know, again, when you're on a hot run like they were before the last two games, you started getting a little bit more of that depth scoring coming and, and, and that's got to sustain. Gord, you know, trying to get a sense for where the Leafs are at um, in the season right now, like going into, into the Christmas break, if you know, Kipper mentioned them kind of taking their foot off the, the gas a little bit on Saturday night. It just didn't seem like, you know, they quite brought their a game. I think we're kind of entering that stretch of the season where teams just throw their rosters out there and the better team wins more often than not. Yeah. You know, from time to time, Justin, they're, they're like, I mean, 82 games, it's a long season. And even like working for a team, recovering a team, you know, yeah. there's dog days. And there's a lot of people kind of yelling at the radio going, are you kidding me? I'd give my, I'd give my eye, you know, eye teeth to work for a team or cover it. But, but it is. It's just like, you know, and, and, and players are human as well. And, and really, as long as they're fine-tuned for what really matters, um, you, you, you get it. You're okay. And that's what a good coach has a handle about that, about, you know, whether it's about uh, pushing them hard, uh, give them a bit of a break, what's been going on. I, 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 Justin, the big box, here, here, here's what they check for me over this winning streak. Okay, a, a number of things. And I, so I think there's a huge positive heading into the Christmas, Christmas break. You know, one is this is a team or people around the team or us make way too many excuses when they get injuries. I don't know what it is. Jake Muzzin, Columbus, John Tavares, Montreal, whatever. Oh, my God, we can't win. We've lost, you know. And Boston starts the season without Brad Marchand and Charlie McAvoy. And, and I like that this time they rose to the occasion with those kind of significant injuries. Our debate about is Mitch Marner beloved or not, I think, is over, okay? They like him. They like him. Everything's good. Whatever residue in the past, fact, fiction, social media, whatever, it's understood. The appreciation for a really great player is there. Uh, so I like that. And, and the other part is they dealt with some adversity. Like, like you can't have – you can't go out and make fake adversity. And they went out, and, and I think part of it, the leadership group, the young leaders – at least on the ice, I got to think within, I think they pushed each other. I think they pushed each other to play complete two-way games without giving up much offense. I really think they pushed each other to bring their game and bring the team game and put the onus more on them to a whole different level. And here when you, hey, any team lose their top, top three defensemen, they're in big trouble, right? And and the Maple Leafs went out with this kind of adversity and, and, and that took the heat off Kyle Dubas because holy Marco, you lose five games in a row and you got these kind of injuries on defense. He he he's got to look at making a kind of move that he that he really wouldn't have probably wanted to make. So I like that they dealt with a real real significant amount of it, of uh, adversity. 
Is there any reason to play the next 50 games, or should we just take Toronto and Tampa right now in a best of seven? <laughs> That's, uh, hey, uh, uh, how about Toronto-Winnipeg in the Stanley Cup final? That would be neat. That would be neat. I, hey, you know, I, I hear a lot of, and you, you guys hear the same thing, fans that have said, well, you know, and, and, and hey, some of them are actually right. They always remain fans, but they go, wake me up when it's game 83. And that's understandable from what's been going on. But you know what? Before these last two games, they got intrigued. The building was rocking. Like, like, like they made that happen. They deserve that. And all of a sudden, people said, okay, I really like this. Okay, this, this is something real positive that I've liked. But you're right for a lot of other people are just kind of like, oh, my God, come on, please, please. Since 2004, yada, 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 longest drought in the NHL of all 32 teams. And, but you had to appreciate what they did up till these last two games. What are your thoughts on the Christmas freeze? Are we too gentle in this league, letting everyone have a nice it's little break? Brian you, Burke thing. Brian Burke thing. Do you like it? Santa Burke, huh? Santa Burke. Yeah. I, uh, they, they do say years ago that um, I think when that Toronto, like Wendell Clark almost got traded to Montreal in a trade that the Chris, that the Christmas freeze changed things. And this, you know, this is quite a while ago. So, I mean, you know, that, that one, it obviously had an impact on if there's truth to that, but I I'm okay with it. I think there's, you know, we've talked society wise, there's an appreciation about, you know, the, the old days when, 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 when men weren't around to, for the birth of their, of course, back then men weren't around for the birth of their kids anyway, you know, what they weren't supposed to be around or what have you. But I mean, just an understanding about that now that, that, you know, these are big, the big moments that are bigger than hockey. And, and same with, it's, again, to your point, Justin, earlier about the grind of the season, I always found that, you know, just around, you know, I don't know what it's like with your dad and that, Justin, but and, and Kippy, but I liked for two days, and now they've added the 26th as a day that's a holiday. Like, there just was this kind of calmness in the world. Like, you just, everyone was where they belonged for 48 hours, and you touch base with friends and family, and if you're working in hockey, you, you know, you did it a pretty big clip, like a couple hours here, a couple hours there, whatever, but I really like that, and I think it's important. I think it's just kind of recharging, you know, getting 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 your priorities and values you know, you know, straight again and all that, so I, I like it. I totally like it, because, you know, having that kind of change over Chris, if it's a trade that's going to be made, it could be done two days earlier, or it could, or it could sustain the weight of the christmas freeze so let me get this straight uh on the 25th and the 26th you're not watching nfl or nba you're christmas uh caroling i'm gonna be yeah but i can't find your house kippy i'm trying i got a group <laughs> out there right now you moved on us yeah joy to the world good, good king uh, good king kipriosilos i did like all words for you too kippy beautiful yeah and, um, and, and you, will you make shortbread and throw us some money yes. or something what do you think yeah is it? Bring us some figgy pudding, Gord. That's you got to ask. <laughs> Besides the lulls for NHL players this time of year, analysts go through it. I don't think you brought your A game today. You're thinking Christmas shopping or walking the dog, uh, visiting well, Pioneer Village. You didn't. Well, hey, following the Ken Dryden back to Toronto story. Come on, I got to be on it. I'm a Leaf insider. <laughs> that, yes, that's you tying are. up my time. And by the way, I do. I would like an NHL game on Christmas Day. Saying that though, I I, I think I would like one NHL. You just game told us it's a beautiful time of the year for everybody to be with their loved ones. What are you doing? Except no, for like that. sixty people. <laughs> I was just kidding. I was just kidding. You're right. You caught me. I'm no, a no, fake. I'm, I'm a phony. I'm... I was doing like a very King family Christmas. Hold like, on. You know, come on. Before yeah. I let you go, like all in all seriousness, uh, did the NHL miss a boat here? Or is it good that they're not playing during the break? Oh, I, 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 I think, well, of course, you have to negotiate it with the NHLPA. So uh, to answer your question, I think they missed the boat. Um, but I, I would, obviously, the NHLPA would have to go along with it. Do you think players would say, okay, uh, it would be to be that one game, like, once or twice in your career, I'd be okay with it? I think so. I think so, right? Yeah. Yeah. You probably go to the... Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I yeah, don't so know. I mean, is it a yeah. trade-off? I'll give you Christmas. You give me a shorter season. Uh, what's in it for me? No, they're tacking two games on Kipper and Christmas. Let's do it. Yeah, but they're getting rid of preseason two two preseason games. That you got to like that. That would be nice, right? Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. I, I think it's great. I mean, who wants preseason? Watch Dennis Mulgan go light up the league. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. No disrespect. And you, God the rest crest, the soul. You, you, and you look at the crestfallen look of the young of the young people as they announce everyone scratching everyone anyone anyone good on yeah. the lineup. Right. People like me Basically. play, and everyone's like, "Sorry, what? It's no good." <laughs> well, Gordo, we wish you and your family all the best this holiday season. You're always a present to us. Oh well, wow! Oh, wow. 
really hey, I, nice. You know what? I appreciate it. And my New Year's resolution is, Kippy, I'll, I'll, I'll pick my game up from this one today. See, meanwhile, I was just coordinating. Justin's trying to get one of those emergency passports to travel. So I, oh. I've, had, I've had that franticness before. Oh, but you know listen, what? They're wonderful people to deal with over there. It's a- well, they, they're actually big up. But I got to tell you, because, you know, radio is at an interesting time. And, and you guys are matching the specialization nowadays, which people want, like doing hockey, but also the radio about personality and um, a- allowing us into your lives and sharing your lives and it really working. So, I mean, because, you know, we go you know way back when the fan was launched and those kind of shows, it's very much more difficult to do in 2022. And you and Sam and everybody there, like, honestly, it's a really neat recipe. So so Merry Christmas to you because you are family, Merry like Christmas family to everybody who's listening. And uh, I, I love listening to the show. Uh, and I love being on. Thanks, okay? Oh, buddy, we love yeah, you back. Lord, Appreciate all your good vibes yes. into the environment, really, into the world. Well, thanks very much. I know all the best to everybody out there. Stellectricity at its finest on the Real Kipper and Born <laughs> show here. Thanks for doing this, Gordo. See you guys. Well, that was really nice. Oh, God. <laughs> I didn't even really kind of pay him to do that. Or I know, anything. and now I feel like we didn't get him anything verbal. Um, <laughs> and I told him he sucked nice. today, and then <laughs> it came all complimentary. <laughs> Um, I had like a point to make when it coming out of that. I lost it. I think oh it's God. that the the NHL should just stay very clear of getting berated by the NFL and NBA. Oh no, no, it's too on. late now. Oh, they just get the, killed. That that ship sailed. The NBA barely, they can't compete with the NFL. It's just it's they'd be. So I wonder bad. how upset the NBA the NBA was first to do it. Yeah. And then NFL said, "Well, yeah, we're jumping in there." Yeah. How many the, games on Christmas the, Day, Sammy? For NFL? Yeah. Uh, a lot, Three. I think. The NBA is a giant. It's T-Rex, but the NFL is Godzilla. And just they squash everything and anything in their path right now. So if they have claimed it as their own, then way to go. It's their own. Yeah. Um, You know, one thing he mentioned in there was he hopes it's the Leafs Winnipeg Stanley Cup final. Did you happen to see Mark Mathot's tweets about Winnipeg today? Oh, my God. Uh, He deleted them. No, he didn't. He did. Yeah, I don't think it was very fair in general on the city of Winnipeg. But, yeah, you know, he's entitled to his opinion. And, and I think we can... Hey. No. We all have stayed in the hotel that he was referring to that wasn't very yes. um, comfortable. Yep. The Marlies would have stayed there when I was there, too. I, I see what he's saying. But, yeah, no, it, Winnipeg is a hockey town. It's a good place. You know, it's a good good place to be a player. I understand why compared to New York City, it's a less fun road trip, or compared to Los Angeles, it's a less fun road trip. Might be a few more restaurants in New York City. Sure. Couple. And also, by the way, easy on the, the throwing stones from the glass house of Canada, Ontario, where I've also stayed, and it's not, you know, it's fine, but it's also not <laughs> New York or L.A. Um, Certainly can have an opinion. Yes. There's three NFL games and five NBA games on That's a Christmas ton. Day. Or Christmas Day, sorry. A bunch of so the, just so many dudes out there just so thankful they don't have to purely uh, do chit chat. The majority, well, I mean, the games suck. The majority of the Christmas audience, Day. though, sick and tired of all the the wrapping paper, the noise. They just get away. They're you know they got their dinner. They're that was done. A, I just want to watch the game now. Clark Gilly staple is the, you know he would say something like Gord just did at the table, a little toast. Everyone eats yeah, and, and then, then he get just away from gone. <laughs> Get Clark? away from me, all of you. <laughs> yeah, the rum and diet in a gra- pint glass. And you was- ungrateful. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I paid for all this. Didn't like that present. <laughs> Go screw yourself. Uh, yeah, you, you yeah. gave him back the driver <laughs> he took from you. I re-gift him a Ping G10. <laughs> Oh, That's sorry. Funny. I thought you were a righty. <laughs> <laughs> I'll use it. <laughs> uh, that's great. I'll take the driver then. Yeah. Okay, we're going to take a quick break. Yeah. Gary Galley, former NHL or Hockey Night in Canada broadcaster and a real good friend of the Real Kipper and Born Show. He is on deck. More after this. <laughs>
is Real Kipper and Board on Sportsnet 590 The Fan. All right, let's welcome in Gary Galley. Hockey Night in Canada, former player. Guy that's uh, always been there for our show, which we really appreciate and will appreciate for the next few minutes here. Gary, how are you, pal? I'm doing great. How are you guys? Good. Uh, this time, all your you... shopping done yet? Oh no, we haven't. E- not even started. <laughs> Is that true? You, you know what I tell my I, I tell my family it's Christmas every day. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if they're going to yeah. buy it this year. Yeah. Well, good luck with that. This, yeah, I, I tried that a few two years too. Yeah. It didn't work. This time of year as a player, did you feel it? You're not even at the halfway point of the of the season, but there is a, a feel when when it comes to the Christmas break. It's like, yeah, I can certainly welcome it. Were you that way? I, I think so. I think it's a it's a time of the year when you're you're starting to feel like you're going to get a even though it's a small break, it's a short break. It, it's a nice family break that 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 you get, and uh, you look forward to it. Um, you know, it's always nice when that game ends and you're back in your home city. Uh, if you're fortunate enough to play at home, but the, you know the trip, you know that trip on the plane home, where you know back in the day where you used to have a few pops and and just relax and know that you had some time to put hockey on the back shelf and 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 really pay more attention to your family and your kids and. And, uh, you know, and uh, the people that are so important in your life and what you're doing every day. Right. So. So, yeah, I always found it was an exciting time of year. And you kind of felt like even though it's it's not the halfway point, you almost feel like it's the halfway point, you know, turning into the new year. And uh, as I can remember, because it has been a while, uh, Gary, we, we played on Boxing Day like they get they scheduled us games. We were we were racing home sometimes. Uh, either Christmas night or sweating it out uh, that our flight wasn't uh, delayed or canceled on the 26th to get to a morning skate. Oh yeah. I, I remember the boxing day games and having to, uh, you know, I, you know, if you were fortunate enough to be in your city, it was, it was great. Yes. Uh, you know, you just kind of just uh, left the kids around the tree and you just <laughs> went to the rink and played your game. And, uh, but you know, it was fun. It was funny. Cause some days, some Christmases you would, you would you would watch the kids open their gifts and you'd barely get a chance to assemble them, you know, and um, and and you'd be on a plane going somewhere to play Boxing Day. So, uh, you know, families, they sacrifice a lot, um, you know, for you to play in the National Hockey League, um, to be a National Hockey League player. You, you do have to sacrifice time and family time. It's an entertainment industry and and uh, you've got to get out there and you don't always like the schedule, but uh that's why, as I said earlier, it's so important to have an understanding family, and a family, a hockey family, right? That, that knows what it takes. But yeah, those boxing day games, those were, yeah, you were wondering always like how those were going to turn out. You weren't quite sure. Yeah, no, I have uh, not fond memories uh, memories of those either. Trying to get to small town minor league cities is even more challenging than New York City, Kipper. So <laughs> you don't feel too bad for you. Um, you know, we've been reflecting over the past week on uh, Alex Ovechkin and what he's done, um, you know, getting to 800 goals. What are your thoughts? You've watched you know, his entire career and the progression. What are your thoughts on on what he's done so far and as he goes for the record again tonight, trying to catch uh, second best so far, Gordy Howe? I, I'm, I'm, I'm such a fan of Alex's, you know, like, you know, I, I just really have enjoyed um, – from start to finish, I can remember the all-star game in Montreal when he had that crazy hat and sunglasses on. He's always been a, a guy that's been such a great ambassador uh, for the National Hockey League. Um, you know, a, a guy that is bigger than life and uh, and plays a game uh, on a big scale. Plays, he's a big guy, thick guy. He, he, he's, he bangs hard uh, and, and he you know, could put the, he has a pea shooter and he can put the puck in in a spot, like without even looking where it's going. He just knows where it's going. Uh, and you know where he's shooting it from. That's the crazy part of this guy is that everybody knows where he's shooting it from. Uh, and it still doesn't matter. You, you, you can't stop it. Um, I think that, I think that, uh, when, when Barry Trotz got to Washington, I think he had a, a profound effect on, on Alex. I think, um, Alex finally kind of, I think understood uh, the relationship, coach-player relationship, what was expected in certain situations, and also how Barry felt he could 
better himself by playing maybe a little different style, coming deeper back into the zone to create more speed for himself, to create, to be more of a challenge instead of, 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 of always trying to maybe sit up higher, try to gain zones. He, he, he wanted him to come back. So he, I think he learned a lot from Barry Trotz, even though he was such a veteran player at the time, uh, you know, and you can credit that, you know, to Scotty Bowman getting to Detroit and, and Hitchcock to Dallas and, you know, and, and, and things like that, where I think it really clicked in with him and uh, he gets it. He just gets it. He understands it. Um, and um, boy, he's just a pleasure to watch. We sat and watched the other night when he, when he was scoring the goals and, uh, and I was thinking to myself, man, oh man, like this guy is, doesn't look like he's getting any, any older, uh, you know, he's scoring the hundred goals between seven and eight faster than he scored some of the other ones. So how do you judge when he's going to break this record? You know, you just never know. As we watched on hockey night in Canada Saturday and the build up towards scoring and all the goals in the past and Gordy, Howe, you, you play the game and the, the most vivid lasting memory for me Saturday night was watching him run over Timmins into the bench and he doesn't have to do that Gary like if he never body checks anyone the rest of his career no one would say a word but he loves it and he wants and he's willing to do that at age 37 and I know every once in a while the role that I played I could be guilted into like picking up my my game a little bit watching other players that aren't supposed to do that do that first and he almost like wills his team to finish every check because if i'm doing it at my age and i've scored 800 goals what are you doing exactly and i think it's part of his fabric too it's the way he gets into games it's the way he prepares it's how you know i i think it's a it's a part of you know of just him being alexander ovechkin is that that's he doesn't know any other way to play and the, uh, and he does I want to lead by example. I think he knows that that's a big part of it as well. Um, and, and I, you know, it just reminds me like he's such a, like I remember Peter Forsberg when he first came on the scene, you know, and, and, and Peter's body just couldn't take it. Like, you know, like Alex's can, but Peter ran right over the top of you. I mean, he just did. I mean, he just didn't believe in all was going around. Sometime it was just through. And so you, you, you totally respect that. Um, but Alexander Ovechkin is, is like a tank. He's just a really thick, strong, powerful man that knows that he has to continue to play physical to give himself the space he requires and also make opponents aware on the ice that he will, uh, you know, he will send you into tomorrow if he, if he can. So when you're playing against the checkers and the best lines that are out there trying to shut you down, make sure you got your head up because maybe he'll, you know, <laughs> he'll shut you down. <laughs> No kidding. Uh, Gary, given your time watching all these Canadian teams over the course of a season, I want to get your take on what's going on in Alberta. The Calgary Flames kind of, I don't know, scuffling is a word I've been using lately. The Oilers lose to Anaheim the other night. Both seem like pretty good teams with cup aspirations. What are your thoughts on the two teams out of Alberta? Definitely, I would say at the start of the season that this was two teams that I felt like would be in a better position than they are right now. I guess that's the the nicest way to put it. I think I expected both these teams to, to, to be in a, in the top three slots of the Pacific division and to have LA and Seattle uh, above the both of them, I think is like a bit of a, wow. I mean, I'm not saying that's where it's going to stay. It's not like, you know, LA at 39 points with more games played than the other three teams and Calgary at 34. It's a small gap and things certainly have time to change, but uh, you know, I, I just I just don't like the consistent play of either team. I think it's uh, it's inconsistent. Um, there are areas in the ice that you can't continue to make mistakes in um, that both teams are doing. Uh, and it seems to me that uh, I don't know if you just click a switch and all of a sudden you just clean up all these areas. And if you go into the playoffs with areas like that, um, you know, the, 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 you're not going to last very long. So, uh, yeah, you it, it's, it's time that these teams start to – to put together, it's like if you watch what Toronto's doing, and I know it's like, you know, just to go back and talk about Toronto, but but Toronto has figured out that regardless of the offensive firepower or regardless of, 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 of how good a team they can be, they have to have some of the uh, some of the key things that a team needs to win, and that is that everyone's on the same page as far as your system and how what, how you're trying to play first and foremost. And then everything uh, comes off of that, stems off of that. And for Toronto, they've got everyone playing on that same page. Even their star players, 
are, are playing that way. Um, and I think that that's the way you have to play to win. I think they're, they've proved it even through tons of injuries. They're proving it. But for Calgary and Edmonton, I find that they, they just continue to lapse in certain areas. Um, Calgary is the biggest. Like Edmonton, I know because their goaltending has been a bit, you know, a bit, a bit helter-skelter. But then it had in Calgary where you thought the goaltending was going to be nails. I mean, it's kind of had its ups and downs. So anytime you have uh, inconsistent goaltending, you're going to have this happen as well. So I, I would say on both accounts, if their goaltending could kind of get going a little bit, and get back to close to where they are. Maybe they're not going to be where they, you know, they, they were last year as far as Calgary is concerned. But if he can get back to a little more consistency in his game, I think it'll make a big difference for Calgary. Well, in, in the Leafs, at least we, we've we seen a stretch where I think they've learned how to be patient defensively and then pick your spots to let that world-class offensive talent uh, rise. Uh, Edmonton has that with Dreisaitl and uh, McDavid, of course. And then you get to Calgary, and they're, they're good players. Kadri's a very good player. Uh, Lindholm's a very good player. But as far as that, that real top-end, elite, world-class offense, they seem to be lacking a little bit. And is it, is it shown now? Because outside of... I, I, like, no, there's nobody outside. They just don't... No one's even scheduled to be a point-of-game player right now for them. Was Huberto yeah. that guy? Was he the, supposed to be that guy, that world-class game-breaker? Uh, I think they expected that he would come in. I mean, this is, this is like a high-end playmaker. He's a great passer. He can, he can score, but he's, I think players look at him as someone who can really, you know, really have great vision of the ice, put the puck in the right spots for players to have success. And, and then we've seen that a little bit um, kind of uh, spits and spurts of it. And you think, okay, boy, he's really coming. He's going to come on now. And then, you know, but again, when you're playing, when you're playing for, for, for someone, for someone like Daryl, you've got to kind of learn how to play for someone like that. And I think for the new guys coming in, I think they're, they're learning how to play under the kind of critiquing and scrutiny and things like that of the game that a lot of guys in the past that I played from the guys in LA that won cups uh, with him there. I mean, they, they figured out how to, how to understand him and what his expectations were of you as a player and how you want you to play. But sometimes that can, that can cause a bit of disruption too. So you got a lot of changes there. Uh, when you make a lot of changes to your top end players, it takes a bit of time. And maybe we're just seeing that we're seeing a bit of time that it's taken some players to gel with one another um, where this team was had it in spades in their top six and everybody just came out and the way they went. Now they're having to make some adjustments and find some chemistry and figure it out. And like I said, on um, in goaltending, it hasn't been as good. And when you're, when you're giving up goals that you're not normally giving up, it takes the oxygen out of your room. It takes the air out of the balloon. You kind of, oh, here we go again, and oh, another goal. We got to get that one back. And whereas last year it was like, man, it's, it's like a brick wall, man. That you never had to worry about it. So goaltending always seems to be the stem of a team's confidence. If a goalie's really confident and playing well, the team plays just really good in front of them. Uh, we saw that in Ottawa when Talbot kind of came in and gave him two or three real solid games in a row that. They started to win some games and feel like they had a bit of swagger again. Uh, for Calgary, I just haven't seen the swagger. And maybe that swagger was Kachuk. I don't know. Uh, but I just I just haven't seen the swagger of a team that I used to watch uh, in the last few years when you watched them. It, it seems to me they still haven't really found the identity of that yet. Well, while we're examining Canadian teams, I want to move it to the other team that really has me confused. And you watch all these teams, the Vancouver Canucks. You know, really, if you look at it in the standings, they're only five points out of a playoff spot. Is there a way to salvage this season for the Canucks, or do they just seem like a team caught in the middle? They, they, where they started and where they are now, I think you'd have to say, wow, you know, they have, they have chipped away. I mean, they, they, I mean, they were looking like this could just be diabolically just an awful, awful year. And they've kind of caught themselves a little bit, uh, but, uh, Certainly, you know, when, you're, when your GM is criticizing your coach's system and, and, and your captain is, a, is kind of a bit of a lame duck where he's having a career year, yet they, they can't seem to find uh, a way to get him signed. And when they thought they were going to get him signed, you know, they didn't sign him. So there, maybe there's some hard feelings there. So I don't know. It's really hard to be a good team when there's a lot of other, uh, other things going on that are out of your control as a player, but they're not out of your thoughts and they're not out of your locker room. 
And, uh, you know, so I do think this team is in tough. I, I, I don't see this team, you know, making the playoffs, unfortunately. I thought they were going to be uh, right up there in the mix, but, uh, you know, but uh, there's still lots of time and yeah, things could happen and maybe this team will come together, but uh, I, I don't know. I think there's a lot of things that got to be cleaned up and maybe it's just, uh, you know, Jim Rutherford finally putting his fingerprints on this and making some of the changes that he wants to make and going in a different direction with some players. Cause obviously he's not happy with some of the players, you know, that are there. I mean, uh, every, every, every week or every few days, it seems to be, there's a different player there that's having, that's, you know, was Besser and, and Horvat Besser. And it just keeps going on and on. Um, it's too many distractions as far as I'm concerned. And it's hard to play when you have a lot of distractions. Well, it, it's hard not to talk Canadian teams and not mention uh, the Winnipeg Jets. They lost to Seattle last night, 3-2. But did you see this at all um, to start the season with so much turmoil there with Blake Wheeler's captaincy and who wants to stay and who wants to go? It's crazy, isn't it? Like, yeah. You look at Vancouver that, that you know, that just kind of fell apart and, and never really – seemed to find it and, and had a lot of stuff going on. And then who would have more stuff going on than, than Winnipeg? And, and the fact that they lost to Seattle, a lot of teams are losing to Seattle this year. It's like Seattle's having – Seattle was a team I thought was going to be like Detroit and Buffalo and, and that I thought, you know, have a good start and, and really get going. But you can't sustain it, right? You're not going to be able to sustain that. You'll eventually, you'll eventually fall back into that. You're, you're getting better. It's coming, but it's not going to happen yet. You know, Montreal Canadiens who – who started out and it looked like they wow they're a lot better with those four young defensemen on the blue line and they follow right back now they're last place in the Atlantic so eventually it all catches up to you and I kept thinking that would happen to Seattle but it hasn't so uh, full marks for, uh, for Seattle and, and beating beating Winnipeg which I which I think has been the, one of the biggest surprises of this year um, you know uh, Paul Maurice decides that he no longer can coach the team for. For, for whatever reason it was and that he felt like his voice wasn't getting through anymore and they bring in Lowry for a short period of time but then being able to grab a guy like Rick Bonus that uh, that wants to be in Winnipeg he's had some of his professional career there was had been behind the bench there before with the Jets in the in, in the past it goes and you know what he wants to make a difference there and I think the first thing that they discussed there was the the culture of the locker room the culture of the locker room what was going on? They seemed to have some factions that were split. There was two or three little cliques that were going on. And I think what Rick Bonus did was he came in and, and, and he cleaned all that up. He cleaned it all up. He brought everybody back to zero and said, okay, we're going to, we're going to move forward. Uh, I give full marks to him for doing it because you got to break some eggs to do that. Um, and you also um, have to have the confidence that these players are going to respond because, you know, a guy like Wheeler, you you know, you take the captaincy off him, he could have easily just, you know, you know, started pouting. And that's kind of, you know, how that can kind of leak through a locker room. But he doesn't. He, he plays hard, um, you know, uh, and and that sends a message to other guys. So maybe where there was a bad situation last year, it's kind of massaged into a good situation. Other guys feel like the voice of the locker room is a little more in the right place. And guys that didn't have a voice now have a voice. And, and, and boy, has it been some, has it been a fun team to watch? I mean, uh, guys are on point streaks, guys are playing hard guys, uh, just feel like that maybe there's just a lot more energy to grab. And the thing, it's just not all about a couple of players and how these players are operating. It's, it's more about a team there now. And I think it, it's showing for sure. Yeah, you know, so Gary, we're almost on our cross Canada tour with you. We just had one more team on the list here. We're we're making you work this like a is, mule and tonight. This is also like, yeah, geez, how, do you, how don't you know about every team in Canada? No, Probably we're not going to ask about Montreal. Shopping. I'm going to be exhausted. <laughs> the last one, last one is on the Senators. You want to grab a towel and a water bottle? <laughs> Some oxygen. The, the Sens, the Sens are six, three, and one in their last ten, and I can convince myself this team's in the hunt. No, you cannot. Can. You buried them. Oh, I did bury them, but you can talk yourself into it if you squint there's can seven you talk ottawa back into this race <laughs> no i i i don't i i think that the biggest thing they wanted to be was uh playing meaningful games in march and april yeah. that's really where they wanted to be i don't i think they knew making the playoffs uh they were hoping it could happen but i think they do realize these young players have been through a lot it's been it's been a, they are progressing they are getting they are getting uh, better in a lot of areas, but the injuries have still bitten them a little bit. Some goaltending that kind of 
faltered, uh, really hurt them as well. But give them full credit, you know. I've done Senator games, and, and they're never – they're always exciting games, regardless win or lose. They, they do play hard. Um, they do come at you. Uh, do they have some defending issues? Do they have some execution issues? Yes. Uh, their power play right now is lightning hot. I mean, it is. They just can't seem to miss on it. Um, they are a team that feels like they can score every time they're on it. Uh, their penalty killing is improving. Um, I think their overall team play as far as uh, defending and, and not allowing quality scoring chances. I mean, I did the Montreal game the other day, and in the first five minutes, Montreal had like four quality grade-A scoring chances. Cam Talbot shut the door on all of them. And then eventually the Senators got on their feet and they got going. They got up 3 nothing, and they gave up a couple late. They made it interesting. But I remember Brady Kachuk coming over to the bench in one of the TV times out. And he said, and, and, and he yelled at the bench, he goes, relax, we're fine. And he said it twice. He goes, relax, we're fine. And this is a captain, you know, he, he's, I think he's learned a lot. Uh, he's got Claude Giroux there to help him. Um, it, it got, and I think he's doing a real nice job of leading by example and not just being that guy who's yelling, screaming, but when he says something, the players, they kind of, they kind of, they listen. And, and that was, you know, I think it was a good time for him to let the players on the, on the bench know that they've got two goals, but we're fine here. Let's don't turn this into a mess. We've been, we played well this game. So they're making a lot of steps, but I don't know if they're going to make enough steps to get into making those games um, what they were hoping to be in March and April. I think this is a three-team race in the Atlantic. I don't see – I think there could may only be three teams in the Atlantic that get through. I think the, uh, they, there may be a real strong metropolitan division that, that may bump out that fourth team in the Atlantic. And, and, and you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of real estate left to go there. But uh, I do see Ottawa improving. I do see them possibly passing Buffalo and Detroit uh, and, and – and, uh, but I, I just uh, I don't know if they'll get close enough to be to be in that playoff picture race in the last six, seven, eight games of the season. But I do believe they are a better team. And I do believe that this team is growing, um, you know, and they've done this without Norris, uh, who I think is a real, really been a big loss. They've lost Zub for a lot of the season, too. But every team has injuries. Everybody can 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 moan about it. But uh, but uh, I think DJ's done a good job. This thing looked like it could fall apart there. And he got it back on the rails here, and they're they, they're just one game under 500. So I can see them being a 500 team, but I, I don't know if they're gonna if they're gonna get uh, in that spot they were hoping to be in. Well, according to your math in the Atlantic Division, that leaves the Florida Panthers missing the playoffs. Who saw that after yeah. the big trade with Calgary? And in Toronto, Tampa playing in yep. the first round. Again. Oh no, we've got that one inked <laughs> in already, Gary. Really appreciate your time, buddy. Um, Great work, Gary. Right. Merry Thank Christmas, you. happy holidays, best to you and your family. Same to you guys. Enjoy your families. Take oh. care, Gary Galley. Boys, Florida. I know. Does, like, I, I'm with him. Three in the Atlantic, five in the Metro. I think so, eh? To tie in. Uh, your playoff picture in the East. You know, I feel, I you know, I have felt this way about the Panthers, that they're not as good. My expectations were fairly low this year, yada, yada. But I got to tell you, the fancy stats have them pretty good. And I know that's an eye roll from a lot of people, but these things tend to flesh themselves out. Here you go, they Kipper. Just, they just can't get a save. They, well, this is it. So this is the farther this way, the higher, the the more expected goals they have. They're among the best in the team uh, teams in the league offensively. Yeah. The better they are this way, the better they are defensively. So they're in the right quadrant of the league handily. Can they get some stops? Can one of those goalies find yeah. it for them and help them out a little bit? Meanwhile, wow. Chicago and Anaheim down Is that here, not Spencer not Knight? I mean, we haven't completely ripping off, uh, uh, written off Bobrovsky through this whole 10-plus million experiment. Uh, I guess. Or you I, think he's still the guy that's going to lead them to the playoffs? No, I don't. I mean, I, I'm not a believer in Florida. I just, I, I see that there are good numbers, but no, it's, I don't know. I've never been a big Bobrovsky guy. And since he's been in Florida, he's had some good stretches of play and all that, but I don't know if he's that much better than your average goalie in the league. Did you catch the exchange between Nico Hischer and Barkov off the face off with the, the cross check to his knee? No. Did you know, Sammy? I didn't see yeah, that. I saw it. Yeah. Yeah. Dirty. A little malicious. Hishier uh, to Barkov? 
Yes, off On the face off. Yeah. yeah. And I like they, that. Way to go, Heath. Yeah, you could probably pull, pull it up real quick here. But the sense was that Florida didn't like it and kind of chased them the rest of the game, okay. which I kind of like. That's the <laughs> part. That, that, yeah, well, I like that that's the response. That should be a natural response that yeah, you go after. Superstar. Even if it's not true, <laughs> even if it's perception. Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't think that's that. That's on purpose. Do you? Well, it, it caused him. Uh, Oh, it's pretty bad. It, Never mind. It caused him. Uh, I, I, he didn't return, did he, Sammy? I don't think he came back, no. Yeah. So since something like that can be very forceful in the right spot in, yeah. in your knee, and the fact that he didn't return didn't help his sure at all, but is that a suspendable act? No. Absolutely not. No. You're, you're in the midst of a play enough that you get to claim it was accidental. Accidentally on purpose is the hockey player's best friend. It's, whoopsie. I mean, how could I... I think he. We're fighting for a hockey puck it, here. It was a play to push him off the puck. Yeah. It'll make him lose his balance. You're right. Trip and, him. And if you hurt him in the process, like but, give him a sting. But, but it would. It's not it, like. It could hit, if you hit him in the right spot, force your knee to yeah. move in a position that is yeah. unnatural. For sure. I think there's a lot of that in hockey, though, where you're like. I know I can give this guy a little extra juice here and it might hurt him, but you don't mean injure them. You know, th this might hurt his upper knee. This might sting if I run this guy in this position. And sometimes, you know, when you, you play recklessly or dangerously like that, so someone ba gets hurt. Barkoff is day to day, uh, according to Maurice, after that injury. So, so far in this section, I've shown Kipper a chart and talked about it and talked about a highlight that no one can see. So really <laughs> nailing this radio medium here. There you go. <laughs> Charts. Okay, news and notes. Robin Doolittle from the Globe and Mail mm -hmm. had uh, an eye-opener for everybody in hockey in terms of uh, her reporting that uh, court filings revealed new details about the alleged Hockey Canada uh, group sexual assault. Yeah. And there's a real sense that uh, that there might be enough police uh, investigators who believe that there's reasonable grounds for possibly charging these guys. Like we're talking jail? We're talking sexual assault. Yeah. I, I mean, whether they're, right. they're tried and convicted right. is another story, but mm -hmm. it does give us a sense that this thing might be coming to a head here in terms yeah. of investigations. We knew that the NHL had basically concluded what they needed to do. And my sense is that we're going to hear from the London police one way or another here probably sooner than later based on this report. And so would the London police... Would they get specific then? Would we get player names or, you know, the... I did read Robin's story and it's really well reported and the whole thing's pretty disgusting. I mean, that's an understatement. It's bad. I mean, it's really bad. And so certainly... Well, does some, does a story, they don't deserve this to just go away. Does, so. does a story like this surface uh, without the sense that they will come to the conclusion that there's enough evidence to mm -hmm. support uh, a charge probably not right probably not so i imagine we will see something to that effect really concerning details in robin's story additional details about mm -hmm. like you know it is the most, older people it, it, it does give us the the fullest picture to date yeah of of what allegedly had happened on the day of june 19th 2018 right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, like we have not, we've not heard. Of there's this a commentary type of... about like an older, well-dressed man who's paid to be at these type of things. You know, feeding a shot to the girl. Like it's the details are pretty bad. So, uh, I guess all I can say is good. Let's find out what's going on here and keep our eyes peeled to. We'll see what ha what yeah. effect it has on the hockey side, the NHL side. Obviously, it's just a big development story here. Yes. It feels like a, yes, like a like a time bomb about to go off with these whatever whoever it ends up being. So, yeah, so oh. we'll just have to keep an eye on this and uh, see where it goes. Absolutely, yes, sir. All right, uh, Stu Skinner, new contract with the Oilers, three years, two point six per. So now seven point six in the crease now. Now, 
they see someone that they like and they make a decision. Is there not a bit of a mirror to maybe what, and I'm not saying whether or not it was the right decision. In hindsight, we can all sit there and say that the Leafs made the right decision in not signing Jack Campbell, Mm -hmm. but could the Leafs have taken care of Jack a lot earlier with a contract similar to this and not put him necessarily in the position of being your number one guy, but... Well, did they not try for this exact thing? I, I had heard it never got... It, it, it was never to the point where they even gave him a contract to think about. Hmm. But I I look at Skinner's numbers and I go, okay, there's some nights he, he lets some tough goals in too, but they like him. Yeah. There's, they see a, enough upside. They didn't wait to see him carry the team and turn his demands from maybe a two point five three million dollar contract to a five million. They they took care of it. Yeah. Well this Do you, you like you, it? I do. You've talked about this several times on this show about how managers, because of the salary cap, have to hedge or have to get ahead. Maybe they make bets, yes. right? They make bets on guys becoming what they think they could become. Yeah. You know what's interesting is, you know, we always look at the guys. There aren't a ton of examples of this working out poorly. You look at uh, Jack Hughes, his his contract now looks very good. Tage Thompson's looks very good. The ones that stand out to me are in St. Louis because they said, all right, Jordan Cairo and Robert Thomas are two guys who are going to be our new core. They got matching, I think, 8 by 8.125 deals. Yes. And both guys are currently below a point per game. It is going to be interesting to see. So this is a good bet here to me and yeah. a, a pretty low risk bet, but it's going to be interesting to see if teams who all make these bets, if someone ends up saddled with the deal worth 5 million bucks and you're paying a guy eight for eight years or something. Well, they, now we know that they're locked in for three years at 7.6 million for their goaltenders. I think that's good. Jack's not going anywhere. That's, that's, I mean, cheap. So it's not, for a crease. it's not crazy. No. It's nice to have your starting goalie making under 3 million bucks per. <laughs> yeah. You take that any day of the week. For sure. So then it's just a matter of if he becomes a one and not a one A B type of tandem guy. You're still in for seven. But do you want to say, right? okay, maybe someone will take Jack down the road and we can. Listen, Jack, pay back up two million instead of five. Jack isn't going yeah, anywhere. Let's move on. And if the worst case scenario is that Jack has an off year, he's got an off year. Try it again next and year. And you try again next seven, year. Seven six. You are not. Uh, you're not making any decisions one way or another this year mm-hmm. on Jack, and Jack can never regain his his game this year, and you still have to be. Married to the fact that he's coming back to training camp yeah. to fight for a number number one job. Kind of reminds me of, and I don't mean this disrespectfully, but like Lucic, where I think there was a point where Edmonton or some teams were like, this guy's got all this money and we just can't use him. But the contract is such that you just got to keep trying. You find someone who goes to Calgary, he finds it again. Like you just keep trying. He did find it in Calgary he and now you can't find it anymore. That's right. So, you know, some of these guys that you pay a lot of money and that's what you end up doing at the end of their contracts. You just hope they find it again. And otherwise, you just got to roll When he's gone, he's gone, right? <laughs> that's right. I, I'm just thinking of the other gamble contracts. You think of Clayton Keller, too, right? Yeah. That was well, signed in, that was signed in uh, September 4th, 2019. That's a eight-year, $57 million contract. Wow. Yeah. He got that con- yeah. he's, he makes seven. He's, he makes seven one uh, until 2028. And he's earning the hell out yeah. of that. Yeah. He's, so, he's that's value. Yeah, Skinner. The Skinner deal is one that did not pan out. Good but it, point. But by it wasn't. But, but it, it wasn't a, like one of those early ones. That was a free agent overspend, right? That's like there's lots of those ones. But I think and actually he's had some good seasons since the yeah, down. But years. he's not a nine million dollar player. Confirmed. What a great agent. I. My God, what a contract. Yeah, like, but then it all balances out because yeah, Tage. Tage Thompson, yeah. if he's scoring forty now a year and he, well on his way to fifty plus is arguably a $10 million player. He is. He's turned himself into what everybody wanted Jack Eichel to be. Yeah. You think so? Yes. Yeah. They wanted Eichel to be that sort of rangy, control the game force. And the other contract that Chica signed was the Jacob Chikrin one. That's now one of the more valuable contracts and assets in the league, right? If you think about it, everybody's sniffing around that contract, sniffing around him because of how much value you have. How many more years left on it? Three? Yeah. At three. Uh, 
if you trade for him today, the Leafs would get four playoff pushes at four point six million, if I'm not mistaken. Out of chicken? Yeah. Yeah. Because he's got three more years after this year. <laughs> The Leafs, of course, will get that. Yeah, well, they, they signed a six-year, $27 million contract um, in 2018. You're the 29th, high, uh, uh, 29th scoring defense in the league right now. I think Chicken would look pretty good. Chicken is this. They'd get three. So this in two more years. This in two more. Yeah. Thanks for so three, correcting three. me. That's a, that's a big difference. Yeah, it is a big difference. This is yeah, a but three, it's still three, three more playoff <laughs> runs at yeah. $4.6 Yeah, he's only played 12 games this year. I'm sorry, 13 games this year, but he does have 12 points in those 13 games he's played. That's probably the Leafs totals combined. And he's a plus seven on the Coyotes. That's pretty, that's that's memorable. Is he really? Yes, he is. Man, how about the the two guys that are rumored coming here? Are guys like O'Reilly and Kane are minus 22 and minus 19? No one cares about plus minus. Kane's a minus, what's Kane? He's a minus 20. Minus 19 or something. Yeah, the highs and the lows of plus minus You care. If a guy's like minus, minus one or plus one, and I feel like it doesn't really matter, but no. that high, it does matter. Don't want to be the worst in the league. Yeah, when being on Nick the Lindstrom was against. plus one eighty every year, it's like, well, well plus minus. Yeah, that matters. Yeah, go look through the the, the Hall of Fame guys yes. and see their plus minus. Yeah. Uh, are you writing off St. Louis this year? No, I'm no. not. Are you? I yeah. I like St. Louis. They have, they got hockey players on their team, guys. They got a good decor. They have pretty like a goaltender who can do it. Mm. They're minus nineteen goal differential, but yeah, no, I mean, I they've won three in a row again. Here's the thing: the West stinks. It does stink. I would uh, seven or eight of the best ten teams in the league are in the East for sure. It's a gauntlet. The East, like to get through the East, like think about who the least potentially would have to beat to get to the final: Tampa Bay, Boston, New Jersey, Carolina, Rangers. All the best, like the Rangers are um, automatic. They're seven in a row, red hot. Look like the Rangers again. Seven in a row. Do you remember the fight that Truba had, I think, against uh, Brady Kachuk where he uh, threw his bucket? Yeah, threw the bucket. Yeah. Yeah. They haven't lost since then. They haven't lost since then. Mm -hmm. And then last night, he scores against Chicago, (laughs) which started this whole kind of mess. Maybe it was the Chicago game that he threw his helmet. Yeah. I thought it was the. the, Maybe it was Ottawa. I can't remember red team and he scores last night and he looks to he looks to anathasio and says uh uh you want to keep the puck <laughs> because he questioned him not scoring he said yeah you're you're the worst nine million dollar player in the league oh call me that yeah please chirp I, me about I that very rich <laughs> yeah. that was pretty good though <laughs> do you want to keep the puck yeah it's pretty good that's great and he's not paid to score at well, the end of the day, I mean, it does wouldn't hurt. No, it, it's a nice little whipped cream and a cherry on top. Mm. But he's a physical guy who takes care of the front of the net and plays, and he's a minute muncher. Athanasiu's estimated career earnings are thirteen million. Nice. If I were if I were Truba, I'd be like, I make that a year, dude. Uh, uh, Ovi watch tonight against the no. uh, crappy uh, no. Red Wings. What do you think? Red Wings, by the way, falling apart at the yeah, seams. They're no good. And I, I, I said he was going to get it against the Leafs, so I'm not making any predictions, but he might get it again. He scores a lot, so he might. Yeah, he'll, uh, he'll get one for sure tonight. Okay, our thanks to Gary Galley. Yes. And Gord Stelectricity for coming on to the show today. We're back tomorrow. Enjoy the OV watch tonight. Yeah. JB, thank you. Thank you, buddy. Derek Brandeo. Jennifer Rolnick and Sammy. I'm Nick Kiprios. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. We're back tomorrow. Real Kipper and Born.
What does every hard worker need this winter? Workwear to keep warm, of course. At Work and Wear's pre-boxing day sale, on now.